Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here and it's a, a genuine pleasure to do this also. My name is uh, Florian Engert, I'm a professor at Harvard Biolabs doing neuroscience and my main interest is in understanding how the brain generates um, behavior and generates everything that really makes us um, what we are. The uh, story I'm going to tell you today is an introduction to um, circuits, behavior, neuroscience, and it's also a story of the larval zebrafish as a model system to do um, circuits, uh, circuit neuroscience. So here is the um, hero of um, today's talk, it's a larval zebrafish. Um, the real power of the larval zebrafish is it's small, it's translucent, and it is a vertebrate. So because it's small and it's translucent, um, it allows um, modern optical technology to be applied to the um, whole animal. And um, as you can see here, this um, fish, which is um, four millimeters in length, still has pigment cells up here and um, along the back and down here as well. But we can use another power of the larval zebrafish, namely that it's a genetic model system to generate mutants that are really completely translucent, like this Nakri mutant here. Um, um, that is really um, an animal made out of glass. The only pigmented, pigmented thing left is um, the eye, and there they need pigment, pigments to see. So um, what we can do with that animal is we can um, observe neuronal activity in a living brain, and we can do this at um, single cell resolution throughout the um, whole brain, and we can do this in an awake and behaving animal. And that's what I'm going to tell you about today. Also, this is often a source for confusion. Larval zebrafish are not insects. They are card-carrying vertebrates. And as such, the brain structure of a larval zebrafish, up here, is um, very similar to the brain structure of um, mammals. This is a mouse brain down here. Um, um, and I've um, put colored uh, lines here that point to the um, homologous um, brain regions. Um, but it's not just that the brain regions are similar, it's also that the um, neuronal cell types, the neurotransmitters that are being used, um, the neuromodulators are all um, basically identical between um, larval zebrafish and mammals, such as us. Such, such as us. And uh, another thing is that the, well, one thing you should know, of course, the scale, it's not the scale here, Larval zebrafish, as I told you already, um, are tiny, and as such, um, they are um, amenable to um, modern optical technology. So here is a, a real image of a larval zebrafish, a live larval zebrafish. It looks green, and it's supposed to look green, because um, all its neurons are um, labeled with a GFP variant, a green fluorescent protein variant. In this case, it's GCAM5 that allows us to monitor neural activity. Before I go into that, I'll show you first a, uh, a brief movie where we can just see what these neurons inside the brain of these animals look like. So here we have a, a two-photon stack where we, at the moment, we are looking at the um, top area of the fish's brain, so the, the top um, slice. And um, when the movie plays, we'll go down, we'll go deeper and deeper and deeper into the fish's brain. And as you can probably see, um, all of the neurons are labeled. Here are the eyes down here. And now we are going up again. And um, you'll see all the neurons up here. That's the cerebellum. This is the optic tectum. Here are all the cell bodies. The black holes in the middle is the nucleus, which is not labeled. And those um, black things that um, wiggle through the brain are the blood vessels that also don't contain any GFP. And um, the, uh, the other thing we'll see, now the movie loops. Um, are the tracts, um, sort of the fiber tracts, that um, project down into the hindbrain and to the spinal cord that um, elicit behavior. Um, I want to remind you that this is a live fish that is um, head fixed in agarose, in cello, um, and we can now um, do anything to this um, animal and observe um, neural activity um, while it is um, interacting with the world. Neural activity will be observable by an increase in fluorescence. This is something we'll see in the next movie here. This is, uh, um, um, again, a larval zebrafish. This is the top-down view here. Here is a side view, and here 
is um, if you look at it um, from, um, from the front, sort of a coronal section, and um, the movie is a courtesy of a former postdoc and good friend of mine, Misha Ahrens, and what you see here is now neural activity throughout the brain um, in a awake and, um, and behaving animal. And that is um, truly um, amazing in its potential. So now we have the ability to record all the neurons um, online, what you just saw that, right? This um, big flash of activity that just um, went on. I have no idea what it means, but um, 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 which is ultimately the next question that I'm going to um, get to is what are we going to do with this now? Now that we have this, um, this amazing power, um, which really I think is the, the most imminent, the most burning question. Yes, yes, yes. So we have the ability to record all the neurons in a uh, awake and behaving brain. What are we going to do with that? Maybe one question that is still uh, lacking, not the question, a, um, an element that's still lacking here is um, the connectivity. So what we are observing here is just the activity of all the neurons. Um, another thing we would like to know to um, explain how this activity comes about, about is the wiring diagram. It's the circuit diagram that underlies this um, activity that's generated um, by, by the sensory input, but also spontaneously within the brain. And um, one modern and um, very attractive approach to that, it's called connectomics, is use electron microscopy to get the, um, the circuit, meaning get all the wires, all the axons, all the cell bodies, all the dendrites that, that, that make up this, um, this brain. And um, because the resolution required is so high, this is um, a truly daunting task at the moment to get the complete um, wiring diagram at electron microscopic resolution. And here again, the power of the larval zebrafish, namely its small size, comes into its own. So um, because it is so small, we can do um, um, sort of a first shot at a connectome, as is shown here. These are all the myelinated axons that go through um, a, a larval zebrafish's brain here. And um, the, uh, this is, of course, done in a fixed, in a dead fish. But the power is that we can um, do this kind of analysis on the same animal that underwent the behavior and whole brain imaging before. So this, in, it, it, in this case, I have to admit, it's not the same animal as the, in the movie you've seen before, but in principle, we can do this now. We can take the same animal where we do the functional analysis, the imaging analysis, and uh, we can do post hoc and get the circuit diagram and overlay it on the functional activity and as such get a complete um, circuit diagram that um, we know produces the activity and the activity in the brain produces everything else that animals do um, and when they interact with the world. Here's a beautiful um, rendering. Um, it's a rotation of um, this um, wiring diagram. And um, what we're trying to do now is establish a pipeline where we combine this kind of analysis with whole brain functional imaging and, um, and, and behavioral studies. Right, so that's sort of the first part. Is This is the technology we have at our disposal, and I think it is truly um, awesome. It is also, I think, um, very advanced compared to what one can do in, in other vertebrates or, or even mammals. In a mouse or in a, in a monkey or in a human, this is um, completely impossible. You can do similar um, things in Drosophila, in insects, and you can do it in nematodes, in worms, but, um, but for a vertebrate, I think this is really the uh, cutting edge um, technology. And really the challenge now is, what do you do with this power? Yes. What, what, what are we gonna do? How are we using all of these data that we can collect, all of this information that we can collect? Um, how are we gonna use this to explain what we really want to know? And that's how the brain works, right? What I've shown you so far is not explanations, it's just maps. Yes. And maybe it's important to point this out, a map, it's not an explanation. It's not. It's, um, 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 and then you ask, so what is an ex explanation if it's not a map? To it? But um, that's sort of a more harder, a more philosophical question. When do you know that you understand something? Or what, is, what, what even is understanding? Um, and that's complicated. I'll try to get that at, um, um, maybe at the end of this um, talk and maybe later during the following talks. Um, but um, the, the 
the challenge now really is to uh, to take all this and and, and put it into um, into a context that makes sense and that gets us from information to um, to knowledge to understanding. Yes. Um, the uh, secret to that uh, turns out to be behavior. In my lab, and I think in many of my many laboratories of my colleagues, um, what we've realized in the past ten years really is that the main challenge is to describe and analyze behavior before you go into the um, depth of the brain, before you start recording neural activity. Um, it really makes a lot of sense if you first figure out what this animal is trying to accomplish. What is the behavior? What is the goal? What is the ultimate? What is the proximal goal? Right? Why is this evolutionarily adaptive, this behavior? And what exactly are the algorithms that the animal is using? So um, what I'll do you, what I'll, I'm going to do, do next is walk you through several aspects of, um, of zebrafish behavior. So that is really the question now. These larval zebrafish, they are five to six days old after fertilization, what kind of behaviors can they actually do? Um, so what do fish do? They swim around and hunt prey. So here is a, um, a movie that shows uh, um, on the further side here is a, um, um, a movie of a fish swimming around. You can see it's converging its eyes. It's sort of turning into a true predator with um, converged eyes. And then um, on the right here, you see a, a skeletonized version of the movie, and you also see the prey items um, surrounding the fish, which are um, paramecia, small unicellular organisms that they um, pursue, hunt, and eat. Another thing fish do is they avoid the dark and seek the light. It's a behavior called um, phototaxis. Um, and here is an example um, how we can study that um, in the lab is um, what you see here is a tiny larval zebrafish and we project from the bottom of the, the dish one part um, that is bright and the other one that is dark. So this is the bright side of the dish, this is the dark side and the trick that we are using here is we follow with the stimulus, we follow the motion of the fish. So um, wherever the fish is, and you'll see this once the movie plays, um, its field of view is dissected, where in this case the left side is um, bright and the right side is dark. And the um, stimulus gets updated, and so you can see how the stimulus now, um, this bisected field of view, chases the fish around. And the other thing you can see, the fish is always turning left. It's always turning left into the bright. Um, he never really succeeds because the... Um, the um, black um, dissection chases him, and uh, we can do a detailed behavioral analysis of this. This is just a, a bunch of left turns into the white side that is, um, um, the fish will repeat endlessly. So this is sort of a, an easy closed loop way of doing um, phototaxis. This idea or this technology of using closed loop te technology such that the stimulus actually depends on the behavior of the animal, this will reappear during my talk repeatedly. So you. Um, better get used to that um, a little bit. Phototaxis. Another um, behavior that they do extremely robust, robustly is called the optomotor response. And this means that fish will just follow whole field motion. So if there are stripes moving um, along the bottom of the tanks, then um, fish will follow along. So the movie shows you a bunch of larval zebra fish that um, um, are just um, following the, the stripes here, which are um, visualized at the bottom of the screen. And as you can see, if the stripes move to the right, the fish um, follow. If we converge the stripes again, the fish will um, accumulate there again. Um, and now when the stripes go uniformly in one direction, when they move to the right, um, they follow um, the motion. You might ask, why do they do that? What's the point? What is adaptive about this? And what we believe is this is a very robust strategy if you don't want to get swept away with um, a moving body of water. So here, in this case, the stripes are moving and the water is still, but you get exactly the same impression if um, the body, if the water is moving with the bodies and the stripes are standing still. And then this um, strategy of following um, what you perceive as the bottom is a very good way of just standing still, holding position in a moving body of water. So in a way, this is a form of, of, of rheotaxis. 
And um, this is adaptive for larval zebra fish because we assume they don't want to get swept away um, by the river into other areas, unknown territories where there might be bigger fish that might eat them or um, um, simply avoid um, being dragged into the unknown. Um, another behavior that they do, like almost all other vertebrates and even insects, is the optokinetic reflex. In this case, um, it's a simple behavior where the fish simply follows whole field motion again, but now by, with eye motion, not with body motion. And um, you can see this here. This is a larval zebra fish that's put into a drum that surrounds it, like, oop, <laughs> like this. And um, the drum rotates, and you can see that the fish is tracking the stripes on the drum with its eyes. Yes. So it's moving to the right, the eyes, and then um, um, will... Um, Cycle, cycle back. Um, here's a really cool um, other behavior. This is escape from potentially threatening predators. In this case, it's a dragonfly, a, a, a dragonfly larvae, which is much, much bigger here. It looks really threatening. Um, and this is the tiny larval zebra fish here. Um, it's a slow motion um, capture of an attempt of the dragonfly larvae to catch the larval zebra fish. It's a movie, courtesy of Joe Fetcho, one of the pioneers in larval zebra fish study. Um, so it's um, sped up uh, or slowed down dramatically. It, this is one of the fastest attack motions that we know in biology. This attack of the, lar uh, the, 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 the dragonfly larvae happens within a few milliseconds, but nonetheless, the fish can escape. In this case, it is a sort of touch evoked escape response. Um, fish will also run away from visual, um, um, vi visually um, uh, apparent predators. This can be simply a, a looming stimulus. And here's an, another closed loop um, um, example where a looming stimulus will show up from the bottom, projected with a video screen, and it's going to chase the fish. Yes, sir. So this is also going to loop now. And you can see the fish is um, running away, or swimming away in a directional fashion um, to escape this um, looming stimulus. So this is something that they do robustly. And also, as you can see, something we can study in the lab. Now, um, I want to get back to hunting because this is, I think, one of the mo more sophisticated um, um, reflexes that they um, establish. And this is a movie that um, Adam Kampf, when he was a grad student in my lab, took um, um, of um, zebrafish. It's a, a slightly longer sequence and then there's, there's the appropriate music um, going along with it. What you see here is the paramecia again, the small um, unicellular organisms that are swimming through the dish and a bunch of zebrafish that are um, chasing them and hunting them. If you look carefully, you sometimes can see how they converge the eyes before they attack. And um, another thing I'd like to say is that the hardest part about making this movie is um, getting the fish to swim along with the, with the music. But as you can see, um, we've managed um, to do that. Um, the movie ends with another optogenetic reflex where the fish um, focuses on the the paramecia he's about to attack. Back to the optomotor um, uh, reflex. So all of these behaviors I've showed you so far are in um, freely swimming animals. Ultimately, if we want to apply the power of two photon microscopy, we have to go to um, head fixed animals. And here we see um, an, an, a zebra fish that is head fixed in agaros. Yeah? Here you see the boundary. And if I play the movie, you'll see two things. You see the fish trying to do the optomotor response. Um, so he'll uh, try to swim along with the, um, with the stripes. The other thing you'll see is this is closed loop such that he's successful. The moment um, um, he's swimming, the motion of the stripes is slowing down. So this is, in a way, a fish that's being dragged backwards um, in a moving stream. And he's now swimming forward to counteract this um, backward motion. So closed loop, this is in, in a way um, very close to virtual reality already, where the action of the animal actually controls the stimulus um, it receives. This is not passive viewing like television, it's more like active viewing in a first person um, computer game. I'll get to that in um, more details about that in a, in a minute. The uh, adaptive advantage of this opto motor response, I alluded to, to that already briefly, is to um, avoid being dragged into um, in larger parts of the river. There is another element here, and that is uh, zebrafish evolved in northern 
India and Pakistan. It's hot there, so they also need to get out of the sun. But um, usually it's, um, as this delta here shows, um, um, rice paddies, swamp plants, that um, with the change of the seasons get drained. And what larval zebra fish in particular also need to do is avoid getting drained out of your pond um, into, the, into the mud. So this is another um, argument, sort of a, a first level argument, um, that um, why they um, should do this behavior, this optomotor behavior, this um, um, avoid getting dragged um, by waters. So the ideal preparation really, as I've said already, is tethered. You've seen already the larval zebrafish tethered um, in, 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 in agaros. And um, what I'll tell you next is how we can turn this really into something equivalent to the matrix. I assume most of you um, know what the matrix is. Those in the audience who don't, I strongly encourage you to watch the movie. So this is something you've seen already. Um, the uh, fish tethered um, in agaros and he's behaving. He's wiggling its tail and we can plot on the other side here, we can plot the tail angle um, um, while it's um, behaving. We can do a little bit better than that. The problem here is that we still get motion artifacts, also the head wiggles a little bit. Um, 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 we want to get um, rid of that, so what we can do, we can paralyze the fish with um, alpha bangarotoxin, so the muscles don't move anymore, the rest of the brain moves perfectly, and now we can record neural activity from the nerve root, the neurons that um, run down the spinal cord, from here to here. And there are two um, electrodes, suction electrodes, that just suction onto the skin, one on the left side, one on the right side. And um, they record now, they pick up the neuronal signals that go to the spinal cord and activate the muscles if the, if the muscles are not paralyzed. This is what this looks like. So this is um, the fish simply thinking about wanting to swim, but nothing really happens, but we can record this online and decode the intended swim motion of the fish, right? So without the fish moving anything, we know exactly what he wants to do. You see the parallel of the behavior here and here. So what we can do now is take this um, called fictive swims, decode them online, and play them back into video screens that surround the fish, such that the fish can now interact with a virtual environment just by um, neuronal signals out of his head. That's really very close to the matrix now. And here's an example of that. This is the bottom of the tank where you see all the, um, it's just random doodles. This is also something that Misha Ahrens did when he was still in my lab. Um, and here is the larval zebra fish. Remember the fish is suspended, it's fixed. The only thing that's moving is the, um, um, the environment here. And what we'll see here when the, once the movie plays is the activity in the left and the right um, channel. And here is um, what the fish is seeing. If I play the movie, what you'll see is the, um, from the point of view of the fish, um, his, um, the motion of the environment. Here are the two behavioral channels that we are recording that get translated into this motion here. And um, what you'll see is the fish is trying to stay on these bright islands, phototaxis. I've talked um, um, a little bit about this already. Um, so he's hanging out on these um, red islands for a while, but occasionally he'll take heart and cross one of these dark gaps and swim over to the next island. The fish is paralyzed, it's not moving, it's controlling all of this purely by um, neural activity. Um, so here we have a preparation now that is perfectly paralyzed, immobile, ideal for doing um, whole brain imaging, but nonetheless it, it is interacting with the world with a virtual world that we are um, simulating for it. Um, in the next slide you'll see a trajectory of um, over 15 minutes. This is what the fish was doing um, over the course of, this, um, of, of, of these 15 minutes. So they really um, behave perfectly in these virtual um, environments. And um, if you look at traces like that, you can't really distinguish that from a real fish swimming in a real environment. And this tells us that they, they are they adapt perfectly to these um, new situations. And this really allows us now to um, um, combine behavioral studies with um, um, neurophysiology. With that, I'm coming to an end. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is, um, and so put another 
word in for our lateral zebra fish. The conventional view of um, not just the scientific community, but the community is large, is that there's a clear superiority of mammals um, versus fish, as illustrated by this um, slide here. In order to correct this notion that you might have, I want to show you another movie that also illustrates an interaction of a, a mammal with a fish. It's again a seal, only the fish um, is a little bit bigger. So what you see here is a seal um, swimming off the coast of South Africa and um, its interaction with another fish. In this case, it's a great white shark um, that was filmed by David Attenborough in one of his um, spectacular um, um, documentaries. And um, I hope this will convince you that it's not always the mammal that's um, superior to the fish. There's um, certainly cases where um, 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 this, the roles are reversed. And I'd like to think that um, lar lar larval zebra fish um, um, can play a similar, similar role when it comes to, to science. Lastly, before I finish, I'd like to um, thank all the people who actually did the work. I was standing mostly on the sidelines and um, applauding. And um, here is a, a, a photo, two photos of, um, of the lab. Um, mostly now, this is slightly older people who did the, the work at the time. If you're interested in all the names, please go to my website. It's easy to find and um, look at their, um, their names. Other than that, um, I thank you very much for watching this um, movie um, and I hope um, you've learned a little bit. Thank you very much.